Out of the Closet, a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction, The Falling in Love of Fedora. Fedora had determined upon driving over to the station herself for Miss Malthers. Though one or two of them looked disappointed, notably her brother, no one opposed her. She said the brute was restive and shouldn't be trusted to the handling of the young people. To be sure, Fedora was old enough from the standpoint of her sister Camilla and the rest of them. Yet no one would ever have thought of it but for her own persistent affectation and idiotic assumption of superior years and wisdom. She was thirty. Fedora had too early in life formed an ideal and treasured it. By this she had measured such male beings as had hitherto challenged her attention and, needless to say, she had found them wanting. The young people, her brothers and sisters' guests, who were constantly coming and going that summer, occupied her to a great extent, but failed to interest her. She concerned herself with their comforts, in the absence of her mother, looked after their health and well-being, contrived for their amusements in which she never joined. And, as Fedora was tall and slim, and carried her head loftily, and wore eyeglasses and a severe expression, some of them, the silliest, felt as if she were a hundred years old. Young Malthers thought she was about forty. One day, when he stopped before her out in the gravel walk to ask her some question pertaining to the afternoon sport, Fedora, who was tall, had to look up into his face to answer him. She had known him eight years since he was a lad of fifteen, and to her he had never been other than the lad of fifteen. But that afternoon, looking up into his face, the sudden realization came home to her that he was a man, in voice, in attitude, in bearing, in every sense, a man. In an absorbing glance and with uncountable intuition, she gathered in every detail of his countenance, as though it were a strange new thing to her presenting itself to her vision for the first time. The eyes were blue, earnest, and at the moment a little troubled over some trivial affair that he was relating to her. The face was brown from the sun, smooth, with no suggestion of ruddiness except in the lips, that were strong, firm, and clean. She kept thinking of his face and every trick of it after he passed on. From that moment he began to exist for her. She looked at him when he was nearby, she listened for his voice and took notice and account of what he said. She sought him out, she selected him when occasion permitted. She wanted him by her, though his nearness troubled her. There was uneasiness, restlessness, expectation when he was not there within sight or sound. There was redoubled uneasiness when he was by. There was inward revolt, astonishment, rapture, self contumely a swift, fierce encounter betwixt thought and feeling. Fedora could hardly explain to her own satisfaction why she wanted to go herself to the station for young Mather's sister. She felt a desire to see the girl, to be near her, as unaccountable when she tried to analyze it as the impulse which drove her, and to which she often yielded, of touching his hat, hanging with others upon the hall pegs when she passed it by. Once a coat which he had discarded hung there too. She handled it under pretense of putting it in order. There was no one near, and, obeying a sudden impulse, she buried her face for an instant in the rough folds of the coat. Fedora reached the station a little before train time. It was in a pretty nook, green and fragrant, set down at the foot of a wooded hill. Off in a clearing there is a field of yellow grain, upon which the sinking sunlight fell in slanting broken beams. Far down the track there were some men at work, and the even ring of their hammers was the only sound that broke upon the stillness. Fedora loved it all, sky and woods and sunlight, sounds and smells. But her bearing, elegant, composed, reserved, betrayed nothing emotional as she tramped the narrow platform, whip in hand, and occasionally offered a condescending word to the mailman or the sleepy agent. Malther's sister was the only soul to disembark from the train. Fedora had never seen her before, but if there had been a hundred, she would have known the girl. She was a small thing, but aside from that, there was the coloring. There were the blue, earnest eyes. There, above all, was the firm, full curve of the lips, the same setting of the white, even teeth. There was the subtle play of feature, the elusive trick of expression, which she had thought peculiar and individual in the one, presenting themselves as family traits. 
the suggestive resemblance of the girl to her brother was vivid, poignant even to Fedora, realizing, as she did with a pang, that familiarity and custom would soon blur the image. Miss Mathers was a quiet, reserved creature with little to say. She had been to college with Camilla, and spoke somewhat of their friendship and former intimacy. She sat lower in the cart than Fedora, who drove, handling whip and rein with accomplished skill. "'You know, dear child,' said Fedora, in her usual elderly fashion, "'I want you to feel completely at home with us.' They were driving through a long, quiet, leafy road, into which the twilight was just beginning to creep. "'Come to me freely and without reserve, with all your wants, with any complaints. I feel that I shall be quite fond of you.' She had gathered the reins into one hand, and with the other free arm she encircled Miss Mather's shoulders. Where the girl looked up into her face with murmured thanks, Fedora bent down and pressed a long, penetrating kiss upon her mouth. Mather's sister appeared astonished, and not too well pleased. Fedora, with seemingly unruffled composure, gathered the reins, and for the rest of the way, stared steadily ahead of her between the horse's ears.'